We all inherit the genetic legacy of successful ancestors. The genes of successful ancestors are inside us. The genes of unsuccessful ancestors are no longer here. Natural selection is the differential survival of genes, and we, that's to say we animals, because we're all animals, we are survival machines for our genes. That doesn't mean that we can't explain altruistic behavior in individual animals, including ourselves. And much of the point of my book, The Selfish Gene, was to explain altruistic behavior. We explain it by um, various methods, for example, altruism towards close kin, towards offspring, towards brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, altruism towards individuals who are in a position to reciprocate, to pay back favors. And that can generalize to a more general kind of altruism. Now, Paula mentioned social Darwinism. Social Darwinism was a hideous misunderstanding, or I should say misapplication of Darwinism, uh, which was applied to humans in the 19th century, in the early parts of the 20th century, right up to Hitler. Um, Hitler, as you know, uh, was a fanatical eugenicist, and he actually tried to breed a superior race of human beings. Hitler was, in fact, putting into practice not really Darwinism at all. Hitler was putting into practice the selective breeding that had been known to agriculturalists and horticulturalists and dog breeders and flower breeders for centuries. If you want to breed a race of dogs that's good for retrieving, then you choose those dogs that are best at retrieving to breed from. If you want to breed horses that are good at running, you breed from the fastest horses. That was what Darwin used. That was the, that was the information that Darwin uh, took from animal and plant breeders. Darwin's huge insight was to take the techniques of stock breeders and say, well, nature could be doing the same thing. Just as a stock breeder breeds cattle for milk yield, breeds pigs for bacon yield, breeds greyhounds for running speed, so nature unconsciously, blindly, I call it the blind watchmaker, nature blindly takes on the role of the human stock breeder. That is Darwinism. Darwinism is the generalization of the stock breeding principle to nature. What Hitler took was nothing to do with Darwinism. What Hitler took was the stock breeding principle which predated Darwin by, by centuries. And that's what the social Darwinists uh, took as well. Okay, thank you for that. We're going to move on to the God delusion now. Um, I think it's safe to say that it provoked a bit of a reaction, uh, got, a, got a bit of a response, largely a very <laughs> hostile response, it has to be said, uh, reading reviews of it in the press and some of the books that have been written in response to it. Um, I'd like to ask you in just a moment why, why you think the reaction was that hostile, but actually just to give you a bit of a clue, I've, I've got another reading for you there. If I can, can will your voice hold up? I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. All right. Right, this is an extraordinarily mild-mannered piece of, of uh, writing from The God Delusion. Um, <clears throat> the opening of chapter two. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. What's to be hostile about that? Yes. Now, that, that actually, um, I intended that to be funny. Um, it it it's, is. It's something to do with the, the um, Paula, you're a connoisseur of English. Um, you will appreciate this. Um, I think it's something to do with the, the use of what are obviously very hostile words, mm -hmm. but they're kind of long, Latinate, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. um, they're not sort of vulgar words. They're, they're sort of words that, you know, you know uh, misogynistic, um, megalomaniacal, filicidal. You just um, wanted to repeat them, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... Um, I, I think that there is a source of comedy there. And, and I, I must say that... Um, when my wife Lana and I do joint readings, which we quite often do from my books, we always like to begin with something to break the ice and get the audience laughing. And with The God Delusion, that, that was the bit that we chose uh, to, to get the audience laughing. However, Paul, you were asking what, why people take offence. The reason people take offence is that religion has had a free ride for centuries. People have simply got used to the idea that the one thing you cannot insult is somebody's religion. You can insult their taste in music, their taste in art, their taste in food, uh, their football team, what, anything you like, but you must not insult their religion. I think the time has come for that to stop. There's absolutely no reason why religion should be immune from criticism in exactly the same way as everything else is uh, susceptible to criticism. But it's a topic that people feel incredibly emotional about, isn't it? And, and, and do respond on a very emotional level when you do attack it. Um, do you not feel um, that that should be respected? I think that respect is something that people deserve, and I think that, that I would, I, I think I would follow, was it Mark Twain who said, um, or no, H.L. Mencken, I think, who mm -hmm. said, um, mm -hmm. Mencken. I, I respect your religion to the same extent as I respect your belief that your wife is beautiful and your children smart. <laughs> okay. We're kind of running towards the end, the end of this part of the event. So I'd like to just give you a few minutes now to explain the main points that you put across in The God Delusion, <coughs> why you say there is almost certainly no God. When you want to believe in something, whether it's God or fairies or unicorns, the onus is on you to find a good reason to believe in it. Because there are a million things which one could postulate, like unicorns, like fairies, like celestial teapots in orbit around the sun, which you cannot disprove. And therefore the first thing to say is that it's not good enough to say there is no absolute disproof of the existence of God. There has to be some kind of positive evidence for the existence of God. Now, throughout history, the positive evidence for the existence of God has always seemed to be the appearance of design in the world. And by far the most important inkling of design that people used to have was life. William Paley himself, uh, who wrote uh, Natural Theology, said that the living world is by far the most cogent piece of evidence for the existence of the Creator. He went on to discuss the celestial bodies, but he immediately said the celestial bodies are not a very strong piece of evidence. So life has always been the theist's trump card. And that particular trump card was blown up totally by Darwin and by his successors. So to the extent that people still try to see positive evidence for the existence of a creative deity, those who understand Darwinism, and I admit that many don't, but those who do understand it, have retreated away from the territory of biology. They've realized that there's no future in trying to defend God in biology. They've retreated to physics, to cosmology. What started the whole universe off? Where did it all begin? Why is there something rather than nothing? I'm not a physicist and I'm not so well qualified to talk about that as I am to talk about biological evolution. But it seems to me that one of the things I've gained from my studies of biology and study, evolution in particular, I've had my consciousness raised as to the power of science to explain how you get complex things from simple things. That's what evolution does for you. Evolution starts from simplicity and works up to complexity. <laughs>